Welcome to the Morally End. My name is Mark Machado. I'm joined by Nick Brooks in South London and Dominic Machado, my cousin, in North America. A lot to discuss today. We'll be reviewing the ODI series against Afghanistan that essentially, I suppose, went all Sri Lanka's way. Uh, we'll be talking, reflecting a little bit on Patum Nisanka's two magnificent innings. Um, and we'll talk about the T20 series. And we'll also mention, because the day we're recording this is five years since the greatest test innings that's ever been played in the history of test cricket uh, by Kusil Jonathan Pereira in South Africa. We'll talk a bit about that as well. Before we get into that, just a reminder, if you haven't done so already, I can't believe you haven't signed up for the Murulia newsletter. It's a free newsletter. It jumps into your email inbox once a week. Um, we write about... Sri Lankan cricket related issues I think in the next few days you should get the the next letter should be talking about Patum's innings and I can't, what else are we writing about this week Don can you can you remember yeah so I'll be doing a little uh discussion about what the series tells us about Sri Lankan cricket aside from Patum's brilliance and I think Nick's providing us a little retrospective a little trip down memory lane about one Sanath Jayasuriya I cannot wait to read those two pieces. As you can tell, um, I definitely haven't put any uh, quill to to paper on, on my <laughs> piece yet. And I'm not sure how the other boys are doing. But anyway, let's move on and talk about the ODI series. Um, the link for the newsletter, by the way, is in the description. And then we're on Substack, Murali and Search for Us, Find Us. And um, thank you for, for being with us. Right, let's talk about the ODI series. Uh, Nick, you've been in Sri Lanka most recently. Uh, what, what's your takeaway from uh, what happened in that three-match series against Afghanistan? Oh, man, it's just like overwhelmingly positive, isn't it? Mm. I don't think any of us could have foreseen, uh, well, such a comprehensive victory for Sri Lanka. And obviously, Patham is going to draw most of the plaudits for two outstanding innings, which... Uh, as much as anything else, I really showed his development as a white ball batter. But I think this is the first series in a really long time when all of the top six have made really impactful contributions, right from Avishka Fernando, who played two brilliant knocks and deserved a century in the third ODI, to Janet Leonage, who like we weren't overly optimistic about how he was going to do at number six. But I think he came in. He's looked like a really hard worker, really busy uh, rotating strikes so showing some range against the spinners and I mean I think he's played three innings for Sri Lanka and two of them have been really important so the top six is clicking I think the other really positive thing is the backup bowlers I mean we saw in the third ODI when Hasaranga and Thikshana sat out how well Akila and Will came and came in and did. And also some of the backup seamers, guys like Prima Badushan and Asita Fernando, who aren't necessarily the first names on the team sheet in white ball cricket, came in and did really well. Um, and then also a shout out to the SLC groundsmen because mm -hmm. they produced pitches for the first time in a long time where, you know, big totals were there for the taking. And that's really good to see. It's um, I thought it was a great series for Sri Lanka. The only negative is that it comes about as far away from a World Cup as you can get. And <laughs> so um, aside from the timing, man, all just like all good things. Yeah, Tom, um, Nick mentioned the World Cup there. The the last World Cup ended where it, it felt like Sri Lankan cricket was on fire. Almost mm. everything that could have gone wrong kind of went wrong. We even ended up being suspended from the ICC. We're back in the ICC as full members now. And uh, it just feels like suddenly we, we've, we've got our groove back, right? Yeah, and I think um, I want to pick up on one of Nick's points about getting our groove back, um, particularly about the grounds, right? Um I heard Silverwood, Mendes, and Asalanka, right? So your, your coach, captain, and vice captain talk about telling the groundskeeper to give them a flat pitch and feeling that that was the way they needed to play um, and that that fit their, their sort of game plan, right? They wanted a bat and they wanted the top six to score runs. They wanted to be aggressive. They wanted to do all those things. So I think... Yes, last World Cup was a failure, but we've started learning from that failure, right? How do we play on 
um, flat wickets, right? Because we saw even in the Asia Cup, raging turners, right? And, and then we go to India and 350 is the par score and we just have no idea what to do. So clearly we've taken that into account. So seeing um, the side learn from that, seeing the top six, not just bat well, but bat with intent, right? Um, to give you kind of a, a two two innings that stood out to me. So Charth Asalanka's innings, the second match was brilliant, 97 from 74, just seeing his power and, and his development as well alongside Nisanka. Uh, but even Kusil Mendes, when he came in, you know, they're chasing 266. He scores 40 off of 29. He hits four sixes, right? That intent, that aggression is what they need to do well. So it's wonderful to see them doing it. Um, the one one negative thing we can say is uh, no Majib, no Rashid. Um, still, Afghanistan has a potent bowling attack. Um, I'll also add in that I think getting our bowlers experience on flat decks is super important. We know that they can produce when there's movement and that they're very good at that. But how do you bowl when you're going to get hammered no matter what? And how do you find the wicket take deliveries? How do you build up pressure? What kind of feel sets do you do? So all that is great, great learning experience. And I think um, bringing in Asita is was a really good ploy too, because he's got a great Yorker and a great bouncer, right? So on, on decks that don't give much, those are two things you need, right? You can't bowl line and length all day. Um, so having aggressive bowlers who do what they can to take wickets um, is super exciting. Um, and also props to Akila Dunanjaya for a great reintroduction to, to international cricket. I was not at all expecting that level of quality from him and good on him for delivering. Yeah, I absolutely slated him a few weeks ago, but he, he proved me wrong and I'm happy, I'm happy that he did. Um, just a quick word on one of the Afghans who I thought was absolutely amazing. That was Asmatullah. Mm. Um, just in, in, incredible player who, like, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I wasn't really familiar with his stats beforehand, but I think he averages in, in the late 40s yeah. um, in, in ODI cricket, which is quite impressive, right? And yeah. was, you know, there was a couple of times when he really put on a, a bit of a kind of ODI masterclass and had to kind of hang about the crease. Um, but at, by far and away, the, the man of the series was, was Patam Nasanka. 346 runs in over the three innings. I, I suppose the kind of 18 he got in this in the second ODI was um wasn't in keeping with his other two um schools, which were over 200, the highest ever ODI score by Sri Lankan and 118 in the in the in the final match. Um is this his ceiling or is this his new floor? Nick, tell me that. <laughs> Um, I don't think it's his new floor, but I also don't <laughs> think it's his ceiling. I think it's somewhere in the middle. And I definitely think we're seeing a player who's still growing and improving. Uh, even the low one that he got in the second ODI, which was 18, was it? I yeah. think it was a strike rate of over 100. Um, and look, I mean, I don't think any of us at the start of the series expected Patham to go out and score a double ton. And I mean, you know, there's long been criticism or scepticism about his strike rate and his ability to hit sixes, but he hit what eight sixes in that double hundred, all of them, I think between square leg and mid on, which like he seems to have targeted that as his area. I mean, I guess, especially against the short ball or against the spinners, but he's so good when the ball's on his stumps that there was a straight drive that he played through sort of between mid on and the bowler in the third ODI, which really stood out for me. Um, and also like, I think we're starting to see more creativity in his batting. You know, when, he went on in that first ODI. He was like getting outside off stump and kind of sweeping balls and doing creative things, finding ways to score runs. And like, I think it's worth mentioning that after Avishka got out in that first ODI and Kusal Mendes put together like a pretty tortuous 15 off 30, mm -hmm. there was like that moment where you're kind of thinking, are Sri Lanka going to stumble here and end up with a score sort of around 300? And... 
like Patham and Sidera put together a really great partnership and they both seem to have worked really hard on intent and upping their strike rate, right? I think we saw, saw that from Sidera this series as well. And I mean, that's hugely positive for Sri Lanka, not just in ODI cricket, but in T20 cricket. I know I've said before, I don't know how those two exist in a top four together in a T20 context, but I think we're starting to see a situation where potentially they can. Um, and so that's, yeah, it's exciting. It's it's really interesting to me because um, I think in the kind of last the the the, the back end of last year, uh, when it comes to Sri Lanka's, Sri Lanka's batting, it was about fermenting the the places and cementing the places of Sadira and Asalanka, and those two as were cemented in and start to ferment into the role and really kind of make it their own in the side. I felt and now kind of it feels like Patum is kind of this is what I would regard as, you know, he's he's been making runs for quite a while. He's been in the team for about three years. Um, but this really felt like the kind of breakout moment for him um, in terms of he was at, at the crease scoring runs, but really commanding it. And he was dictating the terms of play and and was a real handful for um, for the Afghan bow attack, which, you know, isn't a weak attack. It, it, it's, it's quite decent and... You know, we talked about the pitches weren't weren't the regular Sri Lankan pitches that pattern would have been brought up on, right? It was it was different. So I, I, I'm just really excited about what he produced, and I'm hoping Don that he's going to go on and produce this form again all over the world, right? Yeah. So I think uh, one thing that lets me know that this isn't just a flash in the pan. So uh, in the Super League, he had been putting up some. Quick time innings. So he scored 130, I think, off of 88 in one match. He scored 90 off of 88. He scored 73 off of 43. So he had been playing and planning with this intent. And I think when they spoke to him, they said uh, Chris Silverwood had told him, you know what you need to do? You need to work on your intent, right? You need to work on pushing the pedal a little bit more. And I think what's, what's interesting is we sometimes see – Sri Lankan players who are struggling for runs really kind of go into a shell. Whereas when, when you tell them, okay, go out and express yourself, we see them flourish. And I agree with Nick's point about his inventiveness. Um, and I think he's become massively better as a player of spin. He's got offside and onside shots to spin. Um, so he doesn't get tied down. I think um, what was really impressive to me is how he kept the run rate up in the middle overs, because I think that's, you know, I think uh, Nick mentioned the the time when Crystal Mendes came in in that first ODI and they kind of like slow down. Um, but the ability to keep the, the foot on the pedal throughout an innings is something that's really alluring. And I mean, he is so good at threading gaps. He's a wonderful gap finder once he, especially um, on the offside, brilliant at doing that great driver of the ball great cutter of the ball um so i see him going from strength to strength and i think it'll be interesting to see how this carries itself out in the in t20s because i think we're starting to see potham come into his own trust his skills and do what he needs to do to become one of the top odi batters in the world i'm just gonna say one thing one last thing about this right there's been a lot of people um, on social media, a lot of Shrunk fans, so-called Shrunk fans, claiming that Patton doesn't doesn't have a strike rate good enough for international cricket. Patton, and actually, the the general trend in Shrunk in cricket is that you come into the team quite young, and you come into the team not necessarily as playing a huge amount of first class cricket. When the selectors pick you, um, and, and we've seen this time and time again from Willala Gay all the way, you know, you go through Nick's book, the greatest book ever written about drunken cricket. And you can see stories of schoolboys being picked into the national side um, since almost cricket was played in, in schools in Shrunka. And it's 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 almost it's not unique to Shrunken cricket. Even in English cricket, you get players that end up in the side not having played a huge amount of first class cricket. And you've got to learn the game on as as you go. There's a level to international cricket that is it's in, in, impossible to replicate it in, in a domestic setting. There's an intensity to international mm -hmm. cricket that is impossible to replicate. 
And part of that is, is if you're going to pick these guys, you've got to back them. Like, it's interesting that it was Patam and Avishka. I think they were both in the same under-19 side together. And Avishka's career has been absolute stop, start, stop, start. Mm. Where Patton, they put him in the side and they just backed him. And they gave him the confidence to, to become the player that we've we've seen him be. Where Avishka, it, it seems that they, they didn't have that confidence. And he let Avishka let the noise around him and the noise around the team, the noise of the so of by, of created by so-called Sri Lanka fans, kind of get into his head a little bit. Where with Patton, he's got an incredible ability to just, I don't know, maybe he doesn't hear it, I like maybe he doesn't see it, to to kind of drown that noise out. And he's grown into international cricket. That strike rate is 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 looking upwards, the average is looking upwards, and I'm um, it, you're going to be hard pressed to, to drop him, even if he goes and gets out for three ducks in the, in the next six T uh, Twenty games. He's definitely on the plane to to, to the USA. Um, should we look at that T Twenty uh, squad? Three uh, three three twenties coming up. It's very exciting. I think they've sold out Dambula at least for the first day, um, and I assume that means the second day will be sold out. Great job, SLC, selling out grounds. Um, Dom, there's news from Rex Clementine, friend of the show, that uh, the captain, Hasaranga, is going to be battered up the order. I imagine that means he's coming in at three, right? Interesting. Okay, so you took it as coming in at three. Um, I think my my thought is, uh, and I was thinking about this, there's two ways you can use Hasaranga up the order. Right. So one, you could slot him in a regular position. You could slot him at three or four and have him bat around. My thought is, what if you say, right, because I think one of the things we have to consider is Lunkin skill sets. Right. So you don't want someone like Sadira coming in in the power play. It's not the most useful way to, to it's not the best way to make use of your resources. So I think he should come in at three if a wicket falls early in the power play and say, OK, Fields up, go have a hit, right? I don't think they're moving Mendes or or Potham out of that top three. We'll talk about another option in a little while, but I think that would be a really good use. Say, okay, let's use you as a pinch hitter if a wicket falls early on, right? And then you have plenty of batting after that. If he throws away his wicket and loses it, whatever. Um, I think his game, particularly, you know, he's very dominant as an offside player. Right? He loves to back away from the stumps and, and open up that offside. Much more effective when when the field is in than when the field is out. So I'm I'm excited to see that he's batting up the order. I would like to see some carefulness because I think that would also add. You know, we've talked a lot about mystery and strategy as kind of hallmark historical harm, hallmarks of Sri Lankan cricket. Imagine if you're the other side and you're like, wait, are they going to send in Hasaranga if a wicket falls early? What's going to happen? And you're planning and you're trying to set your plans and you're thinking, you know, is Charith coming and who's coming in, right? Um, I think having a floater and using Hasaranga as a well-timed floater could kind of add some impact level to the way that he, to the, to the Sri Lankan side. Nick, two questions for you off the back of that. Is he coming in at three? And secondly, to what Dominic was saying about the added mystery, do do other teams fear Hasaranga with the bat? I feel like internationally Hasaranga is still a bit of an unknown quantity with the bat because mm. I mean he's done very little in the IPL in terms of batting. He has won some games games from Sri Lanka for Sri Lanka with the bat, but not for a long time. And I mean his greatest achievement to date is in the LPL, which of course we follow religiously, but maybe isn't so widely watched by the rest of the world. Yeah. What? <laughs> Are you joking? I had that as EPL, English Premier League, LPL, Lanka Premier League, Indian Premier IPL. League, Car Caribbean Premier League, and that's it. Those are the top four. <laughs> no, nothing else um, matters. But Rex's phrasing made it sound like uh, he was going to open the batting, didn't it? I think he said something about top of the order. Uh, wow. It's interesting because I, like Dom, don't see how... But I don't see that patham kusal partnership being broken up. But as Dom said, Hasarang is a very strong offside player. Kusal Mendes is a very strong leg side player. Mm. So, I mean, that could be quite a nice combination with... I don't know if Patham and Sadira at three and four is then 
Do you risk getting a bit bogged down? But I mean, there's all sorts of wild cards to be thrown into this mix right now, aren't there? Because KJP has been um, scoring runs for fun mm. in the ILT on tricky wickets in the yeah. UAE. And I mean, then we've got Avishka Fernando outside of the squad who, based on the performances during the ODIs, um, has given a strong suggestion that he should be in the mix. So, I mean, it's really interesting because I think, you know, after the Zimbabwe series, we were pretty negative about the look of Sri Lanka's top six. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, all of a month later, things look to be a bit more exciting, don't they? Yeah. I, can yeah. I can I pick up on 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 Nick's comments there about Avishka? Because that, that's where I was kind of going next, Mark, unless you have something you want to jump in with. No, no, go for it. Go for it. No, I, I think um, there's no sign that Avishka has been added to the squad. So so let's first say that this is speculation. But again, I think he's someone who should open um, with Kusal. And I think, and I'll, I'll explain why I think Nisanka might be a good fit at three. But both of them can take advantage of playing aerially uh, with the field in. Uh, Kusal and Avishka have batted together as an opening partnership and did really well in this past LPL. So they know how to bat together as an opening pair. And I think uh, what I've seen in Potham's game is he's so good when the field is spread out that he comes in at one drop he can tick over immediately. You know that he can get runs quickly and tick over. And then maybe you have KJP come in at four and Charith at five, though part of me also wants to see Charith a little higher up than five, maybe taking some balls at three or four. So I think we're, we're in the position where we have good problems. Uh, it also makes it harder for me to see what role someone like DDS um, has in this squad or Kamindu Mendes or, or someone like that um, when you have all this talent around uh, and you want to give them as many shots before the World Cup. You don't want to just say, okay, Avishka, World Cup time, we're going to fly you in and you're going to open for us. Let them play these next six games. Try something different um, and, and, and work that out. It also brings up the Angelo Matthews questions, right? He had, he had a great series against Zimbabwe. What is his role if we have flat wickets and the score is 200, right? Can you take 20 balls in a T20 to get in, right? Because that that's honestly the amount of time we've seen him take. And granted, the circumstances weren't ideal, but that's that's a lot of deliveries in an innings. I don't think um, you can take Angelo Matthews at this point in this squad and not play him. I think he's definitely playing. I also... Like Avishka is not there, so I, I think it's kind of moot discussing whether or not he's in the squad. I think um, I th I just think you've got to stick with Patam and, and Kussel opening. I just can't see why, like, when that works, it really, really works. Mm. I think we're, we're talking a lot about hypotheticals. You know, as Nick said, Hasaranga feels like he hasn't really done much with the bat in international cricket. So you, you push him up the order. I do think, though, that they can kind of rethink it slightly differently and just, you know, ha have... Uh, uh, have um, Hasaranga and Sadira both padded up and depending on which opener goes out then you decide who you're putting in um, because ultimately I think the when you get to the kind of business end of, of tournaments what it comes down to is how much do you value your wickets and when you need to score runs who's at the crease mm. um, so we've got to kind of I, I still think we may there's a there's a kind of fragility still to our batting where maybe until we get to the 12 13th over we probably want there to be an anchor still um I kind of want to be proved wrong because I just obviously I want to play heavy metal cricket or puppery cricket which is about just finding that boundary and um eating Maggie's puppery kotu, which I'll never I'll never know the taste of that. If you've ever tried it, let me know. Um can we talk about the bowling though? Because in a way I think the bowling's more exciting, right? And actually, Ooh. um I, I I I'm really interested to see what they do with these six games because I just can't see the point in playing our frontline bowlers because we know what they're gonna do, we know what they're capable of. I think they need to, you know, Benura Fernando's in for Shamira. I think give Benura Benura some time. Playing, we haven't seen him play since his last injury. Mm. 
a killer, Dan and Jai, kind of proved me wrong in the ODIs. Maybe do we give him a shot uh, at having having a bowl and showing what he can do? I think Newell Thisher is doing fantastic things in franchise cricket, but he hasn't, you know, pulled pulled up any trees yet in for the national team. Is this is 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 this the time to give him a shot? Opposed to when we have an injury and we have to bring him into the fly him over to uh, to Fort Lauderdale to come in for somebody. Um, in that in that third game in the World Cup, right? I think this is a time when you blood these people and you make them feel confident mm. playing in that shirt. What would you do if you were in charge, Nick? Yeah, I would love to see game time like you, Marky, for the likes of uh, Tashara, Akila, um, uh, Benora. I mean, I think I think Benora is a really unique, interesting prospect for Sri Lanka we don't really know how good he can be because we just Agreed. haven't seen him consistently get the game time uh so yeah I'd like to see some of those backup guys getting a game uh I would also kind of like to see Sri Lanka moving away from giving lots of overs to Angelo and Shanaka I think with the front line bowlers that they've got if they're going fine I think those guys I mean to be honest, I'm not sure that they really should be existing in the team together. I think it should be one or the other at six slash seven. Yeah. Um, and I think that they should be there as a sort of buffer insurance policy and in that if your frontline five are going well, then give them the overs. Uh, but yeah, I think we'll probably see a bit of cycling. Uh, um, you know, I do want to see Dilshan Madhushanka because he's been having a like, slightly tougher time of it recently, hasn't he, since the World Cup got a bit of tap in the SAT 20 and then didn't have, I mean, a, a sort of really serious to remember against Afghanistan in the context of things. So I'd like to see game time for him. It's nice to see Patarana back because he's been away and I know he's been bowling really fast in the ILT 20. So it's interesting to see. I mean, I, I missed those games. So I want to see him live and see mm. if he really looks like he's got an extra yard of pace because that could be something that's really exciting. But mm. yeah, I think, yeah, cycling the bowlers. Um, and as you say, giving the backup options a good chance to do it now so they're not thrown right into the frying pan come June. I'm conscious of time, Dom, and I want to get a word on KJP's innings. Yeah. What What's your bowling options going to be for this? Yeah, so I was thinking actually on, on Nick's point about uh, Dilshan Madhushanka, give him a little bit of a rest. He's going to the IPL. He's going to play, you know, he's going to get time, training. Give him a little rest. The last thing we want him to do is get hurt. We've got the Bangladesh series coming up. So I think Benura is a great replace, like for like replacement. Um, he gets a bit more bounce, doesn't swing the ball as much, but you still have that left arm angle. Uh, I definitely want to see Patirana play. Um, and I agree with Nick, we want to go 6-5 um, because the bowling is so strong. And if you play with three seamers like they did in the one day series, you can use someone like Patirana solely on the back end. You do not need, you can bank his overs. Um, so you, I would love to see um, Thushara, um, Fernando, and Patirana as the sort of three seamers and allow the other, allow them to kind of um, duke it out in terms of who gets to bowl when. Um, and then I do think you want to give Pat, uh, you, you want to give um, Hasaranga and um, Thikshan a time because they're just so good. They're so good. Um, yeah, but I think six five going with three seamers is is my option. It becomes tricky with having both Shanika and Angelo in the squad, though. Nick, five years ago, the day we recorded, Crystal Jonathan Pereira scored the greatest or played the greatest innings of all time um, in the greatest series of all time um, to to get Sri Lanka over the line in South Africa. Um, from a, I, I've obviously given it giving it a right load of welly there. Am I right in my, I was going to say estimation, that it is the greatest of things, or have I just got all overdosed in, in KJP, Sri Lankan love? No, man, I think it ranks very, very highly. I mean, I think it was um, quite telling the sort of Anglo-centric nature of the media uh, that Ben Stokes played that innings at Headingley a couple of months later. Yeah. And it was um, greeted with this huge fanfare that no one else in the world could have played that innings. 
And I mean, if you look at the conditions, the attack, um, the fact that he had Vishwa Fernando at the other end, who I don't think is known to sort of hold a bat, um, you know, it's it was a really, really remarkable innings. I mean, he was just kept clubbing sixes over square leg, didn't he? Like, uh, it was wild, man. I do have a bit of a confession to make is that I wrote in my book as if I was like really part of the Colombo feel that people were like crowding around tellies. Um, and I heard that that's what's going on, but I actually, um, the innings started happening and I was in my room at St. Thomas's and I was like, I can't go out until this is over. So I watched it on the laptop in my bedroom and wasn't at all part of the revelry. But I did go out afterwards. I remember going to the Havelocks Rugby Club and just, it, there was, you know, it was at a time when Sri Lankan cricket wasn't going very well and suddenly mm. there was like this electricity in the air and everyone was talking about that innings. Um, so, I mean, it's very cool. Uh, I also think it's there's something kind of amazing about the fact that Kuso hasn't done a huge amount mm -hmm. apart from that in Test cricket. He's just played this like one absolutely out of this world innings. Um, and props to Vishwa as well for hanging around and making it happen. But yeah, I think it ranks very highly, certainly in the... Um, in the greatest test innings I can remember watching live in Sri Lanka's list of, you know, all time innings. And yeah, probably in the pantheon of great innings all in all. So you've got two kids. What would you tell them about their, their innings when, when they ask about it in a you few know, years? It's funny. Um, so in South Africa, right. So it's really tough to watch tests in Sri Lanka in the United States because they start at 1230 and they run till 730 in the in the morning um but with the south africa series i was waking up at six o'clock to catch the last two and a half hours so i wake up and kusal is on 80 something there's still 90 odd runs to go and i can just see him depositing dale stain into the into the bank in the embankment over on on square leg and Will comes down, my son, who is one and a half, and he's watching with me and he's cheering with me uh, as it's going on. And I just couldn't believe it. It's one of those moments where uh, fact is stranger than fiction, right? Uh, you take the player, I think, as Nick said, Casal Pereira, let you look at all the other great innings. You're talking about Laura, what he does in, in a fourth innings. You're talking about Ben Stokes, what he does in a fourth innings. This is Casal Jonathan Pereira. I think he has three test centuries to his name. He averages 35 um he you know he's a very normal test batsman but that day he was smashing a very very good south african attack and i can just remember the elation uh when he when he kind of edged that ball for four uh to to win the match and he didn't even really celebrate his hundred that was the other part he was a man on a mission that day you score a fourth innings hundred against that attack in south africa you're you're beating your chest you're you're proud but he was he was prepared to stick it out there. I remember the close moments. There was a hairy run out involving Vishwa Fernando where like he came halfway down the track and they missed. There were a couple Yorkers from Dale Stain that just like nearly hit the stumps. And that was test cricket at its best. You know, every possibility is open. Um, it's the last day. You think everything's lost. And guess what? You get a magical innings that just changes the day and i every time i feel a little bit down i'll just search kjp 153 durban and uh and watch that knock uh for me the whole that inning sums up everything it means to be a shrunken cricket fan and everything in a way it means to be Sri Lankan, right when you're shrunken when with with, with Sri Lanka and around shrunken people Everything that could possibly go wrong has at some point gone wrong. <laughs> and the whole the whole thing about Sri Lankan cricket is that there it gives people hope in in moments of utter darkness sometimes. Mm. And that was that great the thing about that innings is, is that it's it it is it, that moment, isn't it, where you just think everything's about to go wrong. But yeah, as long as there is a possibility, as long as there's a one in a billion chance that this guy yeah. can stick about and get us over the line, it could happen. And sometimes Sri Lankan cricket has had some really bad moments recently, uh, mainly when we played India. But we still, oh, I still believe, because I always think, you know, well, we're going to keep always producing players who have the ability 
to have that kind of mental block out that KJP had that day and get us over the line. And that that's why I just think it, it it's so brilliant because it, it speaks to the core psyche of what attracts Sri Lankans to this beautiful game. Yeah. Guys, should we leave it there? Absolutely. Um, um, if you haven't already, hit the follow button, subscribe, Tell, um, sign up to the newsletter, tell your friends about us. Uh, we'll be back again next week. Thanks for listening. Bye.